year 2021. The machines have won. The Ravagers ravage and already ravaged human cityscapes ravagingly. Underground, overground, ravaging free. All hope has been lost for the humans and the elves and the oofs of the multiverse. The unstoppable, mobilized and mechanized death force have crushed all in their wake. Resistance is futile. Oh, no, wait, sorry. The opponent just cast a stony silence, followed by a fracturing gust on the following turn. <laughs> GG, get wrecked! Hello boys and girls, it's me, Vince, also known as Pleasant Kenobi on the internet. I'm often cited as being the Magic the Gathering content creating equivalent of that androgynous white-haired character from the Matrix that didn't want it all to end quite like this. Not like this. This is me every time I die to combo. Darkness, my old friend. Not like that. I've come to talk with you again. Every time. This week I am bringing you some Affinity gameplay. Affinity is quite simply the best game one deck in the format at its best when no one's expecting it and at its very, very worst when there's a Stony Silence in play alongside a Kentucky and a Damping Matrix and there's four copies of Ancient Grudge in the graveyard. And let's face it guys, if that was going to happen, it'd be me that it happened to. Affinity is essentially an aggro deck that plays a lot like a fast combo deck. You have a selection of cheap artifacts that are simply cheap bit players that allow for a critical mass and provide fast mana. Combine these enablers with a strong payoff like Arcbound Reverend Cranial Plating or Master of Ethereum, and you have a deck that looks to set up blisteringly fast combat step kills, but folds horribly, horribly, horribly to the omnipresent hate cards of the format. A turn 2 Stony Silence will often spell game over for the majority of unprepared affinity hands. It really is that much of a beating. It is for that reason that the deck tends to play a very reactive cyborg plan in which it transitions its flex spots into ways to fight expected hate or disrupt combo. This is a rather stock list that took down SCG Modern IQ in Centerville, I think that's pronounced incorrectly, piloted by Joshua Smith. The list is pretty straightforward aside from the fact that he appears to play one less land than pretty much everyone that's ever played the deck, and in that slot he has slipped in a slippery sliding copy of Claim to Fame, which allows him to bring back Ravagers and Steel Overseers, basically a recursion for any high impact payoff aside from Cranial Plating or Master Ethereum. Essentially, Claim to Fame is the spicy cherry on top of a very vanilla cake, a cardamom seed amongst the pilau rice, a diamond in the rough, or perhaps a drop of glistening pre come on the very tip of my massive robotic penis. How spicy is this spice though? Well, I decided to ask one of Britain's greatest exports, the spicy Susan Boyle herself. I asked her, do you think my affinity list is spicy? Spicier than the Spice Girls? But which Spice Girl is spiciest? Spoiler alert, boys and girls, it's obviously Jerry. And then I noticed that our beloved Subo hasn't even tweeted since July last year. Where are you, Subo? Where are you when we need you most? Now, some people call this deck robots as opposed to affinity, which perhaps appeals because of the issues we all have, a side effect of the modern condition in which our listless existential malaise can be suppressed and dismantled by the ongoing mechanization of our everyday lives. We are all part man, part robot now. Just think about how much of your everyday life is automated by computers. When the bombs fall and the EMPs fry our computers, we are fucked. Modern society is not ready for a world in which we can't microwave a baked potato to speed up the cooking process. Honestly, who the fuck wants to wait 40 minutes to bake a fucking potato? Fuck that. However, I still retain the name Affinity. Now sure, once the Affinity players had almost universally moved away from playing Thoughtcast, the deck no longer had any cards in it that actually had the Affinity mechanical keyword. However, Ravagers were a key part of that deck, as was the cranial playing throughout Standard, Extended, Modern and all iterations of the deck. And I like that call back to its history, it's giving this game some depth and interesting stories to be told about the names of the decks. Respect your elders, kids. And of course, before we get started, I, as always, a huge, huge shout out to my sponsors over at MTGO Traders for making this possible. Remember, using the discount code GGGETREX to get 8% off of your order when you use the site will help promote me and help the channel. And I can't thank my patrons either. You guys keep me motivated and help me to make this content, so one love there as well. Right then, let's get to it. Let's robot some bitches. We keep a hand with man lands, free creatures, and a master of Ethereum for payoff. The hand looks pretty sweet. A turn 1 Inquisition of Kosalek takes our master and we feel bad. Real 
real bad. Luckily, we draw a Ravager, which is something. We shit out most of our hand, like my bowels after a particularly spicy curry. We then get inquisitioned again, which is fucking ridiculous. He misses a land drop, however, so I don't feel too bad about this. We play a Scourge and start to beat down with a plethora of powerful 1-1 creatures. Fear me! Our opponent manages to make his second land drop and plays a Bob. We draw some absolute hotness in the form of Cranial playing, one of the best payoffs to have when you have onboard flyers. We suit up our Scourge and get into the red zone. We allow the opponent the opportunity to trade Bob for a Memnite, but he chooses not to. Bob nets him a land because of course it fucking does, and he plays the land and passes with three mana up. I can smell a Cake Man from a fucking mile off. We animate one of our Ink Moth Nexus and swing for the fences. Bob dives in front of a Memnite and we activate another Ink Moth to maximise plating damage. Lo and behold, we see a Cake Man which is fucking brutal against Affinity. He kills our man land and blows up our plating. He plays a Raging Ravine which reveals that our opponent is in fact traditional Jund and not just some red black rock deck. A Liliana the Veil causes us to sacrifice a Memnite and we get to cast our Steel Overseer, then use it with a drum to spring our Ink Moth to life. We kill Liliana and hit our opponent down to four. A second Liliana of the Kale makes us sack a Bolt Scourge and he rather brashly, despite his life total, slams a Bob into play. Our opponent has balls and or flaps of fucking steel. We animate a Man Land, activate an Overseer and crash into his face for two damage. Ironically, he reveals a Bob to a Bob, which is enough to kill him, just like rain on your wedding day. We keep a pretty solid if a little slow hand, we lead with Volt Scourge and our opponent shocks himself on turn 2 to lay down a bob. We get in for 1, cast the Steel Overseer and feel confident, he resolves the Liliana of the Last Coat. And what a bloody lovely fur coloured coat it is too, if a little revealing. This card is back breaking for any deck playing X1s, especially our assorted collections of shitty 1-1s. She kills Overseer and Bob starts battering us upside the head. We really, 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 really need to draw a protect our guys from these Liliana activations, but instead we draw another land. Balls. I played two X1s in the hope to stress the Liliana and pray he doesn't have any other removal in hand, and we get in for a whopping one damage. Bob draws him an engine and explosives, and I feel pretty weak about all this. EE lines up very well with the X champion in my hand, however, in spite of it getting his own Bob, he plays it and activates it and blows away the board. We play a Dark Steel Citadel on an X champion who is now online and is very, very hard for Jun to actually deal with, except he casts Flaying Tendrils. We draw a plating, which gives us a way to kill Liliana without it killing our little creature with our man land, but he has a bolt. Looks like he has it all, and we decide to go to game three. We have a slightly faster hand this time round with Double Single Pest and Nets Champion. Aside from the flame tendrils draw from the opponent, which we don't really beat anyway, this hand seems strong. We drop it like it's hot and pass back with a board full of tasty artifacts. Our opponent plays a wooded foothills and passes the turn. This is good for us. We swing and he doesn't kill a pest, which suggests no push or bolt in his hand. We crack in for four damage and empty our hand with a champion and a knight, just like me after a night on the beers. On his turn two, our opponent's already staring down a two turn clock. We crash in and he does very little. His hand must be absolute garbage. No second black source dodges a tendrils or Liliana. A pulse kills both our pests, turning the clock from dead on board to one more turn to stabilise for him. I decide to not play out our Scourge for fear of Tendrils of Damnation, and then he concedes and we get there through the weenies. Fun fun fun. We have a sketchy 7 so we ship it back, looking for a piece of payoff to get there. We see a hand with a Volt Scourge and double plating. Let's do this. Our opponent leads with an Adrazi Temple on turn 1, which always makes me think, regardless of whether it's Adrazi Tron, Bant, or Death and Taxes variants, there's a very real likelihood of a turn 2 Thought Not Zero on the way. We only deposit half our hand like a patient with a serious fecal impaction. I mean, look it up if you dare. But oh look, as expected, Daddy's home. Cotton Eye Joe over here rips a plating out of existence. However, our constipation's over thanks to a healthy dose of free spells and mana like a fucking laxative, and we unload the rest of our shit, suit up, and get to work slapping our opponent upside the head. Our opponent goes towards himself and uses a Wasteland Strangler to kill our Scourge with its ETB, so it looks like we get Eldrazi and Taxes because of the Black Lands. We untap and get into the red zone with a Cranial Plating equipped with Ink Moth Nexus, dealing 7 whole points of infect. Our opponent gets lucky and plays a second Ghost Quartz to deal with our Ink Moth Nexus next turn, but we also get lucky and do our second Ink Moth. We go into combat and lose our first Ink Moth Nexus to Ghost Quarter as expected. We suit up the Memnite to make a blocker that can trade with Thought Not Seer. Our opponent desperately crashes in with everything and we trade off and draw an extra card. We untap animate our ink moth we played last turn, equip it and kill him. 
Our opener is looking really sweet. We have two bits of cyborg tech and aether grip which allows us to play around stony silence by being able to ping with our artifacts as the ability is part of the enchantment and thus usable through stony silence. We also have blob moon which would be absolutely destroy their greedy greedy mana base given half a chance. We windmill slam this keep. He leads to the cave and passes and we ejaculate half a loadout thanks to the drawing of the zero cost memlite and even have galvanic blast up to kill anything he plays this side of a thalia guardian of thraben. Tide hollow scholar is deployed and takes our blood moon which feels incorrect but it doesn't really have a huge amount of choice considering our stacked, stacked hand. We blast the zombie on end step, untap and moon him. He takes his turn, plays a wonderful non-basic mountain and then concedes. It looks like robots under a blood red sky will beat the Eldrazi menace. GG. Alright, seven and find ourselves up against a fan, which is super sweet. We leap with a slow land into drum plus opal line, and our opponent plays a champion of the parish. Shumans, eh? We draw and play a ravager with the intent of ravaging this poor player. Our plan is to ravage them harder than they've ever been ravaged before. We also play a shitload of drums, like a whole fucking bunch, like an entire kit, snare, cymbal, and fucking bass drum. We see a double inspector gadget on turn two from him, pumping his champion to a three three, and we get we play a second ravager and a master of Ethereum. We don't get to swing this turn, but I'm starting to think that we may need to just go all in on the Ink Moth Nexus due to all the ground blockers, with Ravager eating all the drums up and sticking it into the Nexus. Our opponent plays a Glory Bound Initiate, another card I'm very fond of, and I feel mean that I'm trying to kill someone playing such a sweet homebrew white weenie human deck. Sorry, mate. The initiate will also make the race quite complicated, so I untap, I play a Vault Scourge to maximise the number of artifacts in play and get into the red zone with both my Incomoth Nexuses, Nexi, or Nexi, or whatever the fuck it is. I faff about like a twat for a few minutes as I decide whether I should test him and go for it, and then say fuck it and go all in on it. He dies. Bang, bang, motherfucker. <laughs> We keep a hand with artifacts, two payoffs, and a piece of burn. Oh, and I was listening to Lady Gaga when I recorded this. Fight me IRL, you pricks. Our opponent leads with just a basic plane. It was a strong opener if ever I saw one. Although our hand is strong, it is a tad slow, and we open with a signal pest and pass. Turn two champ from him, we follow up with a Vault Scourge. Scourge is awfully good at fighting back into the aggro decks when you stick a plating on him. Like, absurdly good. He deploys a Glory Bound Initiate, which really turns this into an awkward race if left uncontested. I decide to not play Master of Ethereum, instead of redeploying a Ravager and keeping up a Galvanic Blast in order to deal with the Initiate. We get in with a Battle Cry and a Scourge, and he attempts to path our Ravager and end step. We sacrifice it to itself and put a count on the Scourge. I don't know what it is. Doesn't anyone else think the word Scourge sounds like a name for a pirate or something? Like, Yar, Captain Scourge, or some shit. God, my pirate accent is bad. I'm never doing that again. He plays a personal favourite card of mine, always watching, and goes into the red zone. However, we blast the initiative before the exert trigger resolves. Boom! Headshot! No life gain for you! Do not cross go! Do not collect 200 pounds! We play some free shit, play a plating, equip it, and smash face. He decides he's said enough, and he concedes. Ah, GG, matey! Oh, it's okay, I did it again. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I can't help myself. Ultimately, I still really, really like Affinity as a deck because it's a sweet aggro deck that has a lot of intricacies and ways to take a game plan. Some games are rather one dimensional as you vomit artifacts into play and then smash face, but man lands, ravagers, and instant speed switcheroos or playings make the deck a rather tricksy little animal with cool interactions and nuances that some players might just miss. I played about 10 or 12 games of the deck in total and I cast Claim to Fame maybe once. It was actually stuck in my hand sometimes with no target in the bin. It was just pretty dull. I would be interested to find out if the original part of the deck actually thought it was a good addition or whether he thought, actually, you know what, I probably shouldn't play that card. The card is probably better if just play with another threat. Um, I didn't think the land count was too low, so the 16 is actually probably quite a good place for affinity, actually. Um, maybe even a welding jar in that slot to enable the artifact payoffs as well as protecting them. So, yeah, I just don't think Claim to Fame was that exciting. I wonder what Subo will make of it. Well, on top of a welding jar, being able to protect your cranial plating is probably better than bringing back a Ravager because plating is probably the best card in the deck. So, do you guys like Affinity? Is there some other spice I could try on the deck at a later date? Is there a better deck in the format for Claim to Fame? Let me know in the comment section below. Make sure to leave the video a like and drop me a comment. Even if you have nothing to say at all, you can always just say hashtag fuck off John. Rumour has it that if enough people type that in the comments, it will summon him. It, he will reappear with a deck that costs less than $10 that isn't completely and utterly terrible. The Baptist rises. 
Make sure you are subscribed and don't forget to follow me over on Twitter, Instagram and like the Facebook page, all of which I am called Pleasant Kenobi on. Share the video! With each view I become stronger, my bulge bigger, my libido heavier and my mother less proud. You can also support me on Patreon directly if you are so inclined. I'll put some links to other videos from me, some magical and perhaps even some not, but either way, my beautiful voice and even my beard make an appearance in them, so make sure you click those links, watch the videos and fap heartily. I will leave you with this thought. You can always see your nose, but your brain blocks it out. But now I've mentioned it, can you see your nose? And in addition to that, if a nose falls in the forest and no one's around to see it, does it really know? I've been Pleasant Kenobi and I'll speak to you all very, very very soon.